Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the SAT Official Study Guide 2020. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need this. Always make sure that the book is in front of you. Today we'll solve some problem that you will find on page number 1246. 1246, let's turn to it. 1246, the very first problem that we see there, number 24. In number 24, we're dealing with a circle and we are told that it has a center of 0, 0,4. It has a center of 0, 0,4. So we have a circle, the center is at 0, 0,4. Let's see what else we know. We also know that we also told and the radius with the endpoints with endpoint. 4, 3rd and 5. So we have a circle, we are told a circle with a center of 0, 4 and a radius with the end point of 4, 3rd and 5. That's the width. Let me rewrite it. So it ends somewhere on 4, 3rd. Let's put it here 4, 3rd and 5. There we go. So we know, we know the center. And we know that we have we can use this equation x minus x1 squared plus y minus y1 squared equal has to equal radius squared. X1, x1 and y1 represent the center. Which we know. That's the center, which we know. So we know the coordinates of x1 and y1. We just have to figure out the radius of this circle. If we can somehow figure out the radius, we can put it in here and solve for it. We already know the coordinates of x1 and y1. Let's see what we can do with the radius. It's very straightforward, very simple. We're simply going to drop a perpendicular from here. This is the right angle. This is the guy we're looking for. We're looking for the radius. We know this length. We know this length. We know that length. That the coordinates of this point, the x coordinate is going to be 4 third, and the y coordinate is the same. It's just 4. There you go. So the distance from here to here is just 4 third minus 0. Let's put it here. So we're trying to figure out the radius by simply using Pythagorean theorem. A simple application of Pythagorean theorem will give us the radius. And Pythagorean theorem tells us that the radius squared, which is the hypotenuse, Pythagorean theorem tells us that the hypotenuse squared, which in this case is the radius, has to equal the square of this distance and square of that distance. Square of this distance simply 4 third minus 0. And the y distance, the vertical distance, simply 5 minus 4. Nothing to it. As you can see, as you can see, it's a simple application of Pythagorean theorem. This is also sometimes referred to, this is also sometimes referred to as a distance formula. Why is it also called distance formula? Because they want to scare the hell out of you. A distance formula and Pythagorean theorem are one and the same. They are not two different things. It's the same animal being referred to, being called by, by two different names. Pythagorean theorem, distance formula are one and the same. Distance formula, in other words, is simply Pythagorean theorem incognito. A distance formula is simply Pythagorean theorem incognito. Enough of the talk, let's begin. 4 thirds squared is just going to be 16 over 9 plus 5 minus 4 which is 1, 1 squared is just 1 which we can write that as 9 over 9. 16 plus 9 is 25, 25 over 9 is r squared and therefore r, it implies that r must be square root of this quantity which is 5 third. There we go, we just found this radius, it's just 5 third. Now we can go back to the formula that we had on the blackboard before, put it in the value, put, put in the value for the radius, we already know the center of the circle, we are home free. which is simply x minus x1 
squared plus y minus y1 squared has to equal radius squared. We know the x1 and y1 is right here. So x minus 0 squared plus y minus 4 squared has to equal r squared, which is simply 25 over 9. x minus 0 squared plus x squared plus y minus 4 squared has to equal 25 over 9. And that's it. That's, that's the equation we were looking for. The question was, what is the equation of a circle that has a center of 0, 4, and it ends, one of its endpoints is at 4, 3rd, and 5. We just found it. And that's answer choice A. That happens to be answer choice A. If you look at the answer choices, it's the very first one. Let's go to number 25. Number 25. Incognito is a vocabulary word, SAT vocabulary word that we learned long time ago in our vocabulary lesson on day number 42. As I always remind you, it is important, it is vital, it is crucial, it is absolutely essential that you work on your vocabulary. You mustn't forget the other half. Vocabulary is something that you can work on your own. Go to my channel, look for this series of videos, there are 100 videos. For this particular word, just type in SAT vocabulary words, day 42, the video will pop right up. You learn this word and many other good vocabulary words for the SAT, the words that appear on the SAT over and over again. Number 25. In 25, we are told that the initial velocity, initial velocity, which is written as v naught, is equal to 25 meter per second. 25 meters per second. Before we go any more. Any further, that is, this is this is read as this is read as v naught n a u g h t. It is not to be read as v zero. V naught represents the initial velocity. Naught simply means zero. It's just a fancy way of saying zero, but that's how we read it. It's v naught. Another word, another vocab word that we long long time that we learned long time ago. I'm going to very quickly give you the word day. You can you can learn it yourself. Day number seventy four. What we're going to find here is that the knowing that the initial velocity of the object was 25 meter per second squared, as we read the rest of the problem, we will find that this information has absolutely no relevance, no value to us. What we are interested in is the equation that is given to us, and the equation tells us that the height of the object at any given point in time is given by this equation, negative 4.9 t squared plus 25 t. The question simply is, well, how long does it take? How long does it take for it to hit ground? If I release some object, if I release some object at the initial velocity, not at a zero velocity, but at the initial velocity of 25 meter per second, 25 meter per second, which is absolutely irrelevant to us. It really makes no difference at all as to what the initial velocity is, because the initial velocity does not appear here. The height at any given point in time is a function of how long it has been in the flight, how long the object has been in flight. And the question simply is, how long does it take before it gets back to ground? Well, when it hits the ground, when it hits the ground, the height is zero at that point. The height is zero at that point. So that's the equation we're working with. How long does it take for it to hit the ground? We have to solve this equation. In other words, all of this has to equal zero. Let's work on it, shall we? We can take out t common. We have t squared and t. Let's take out t common. And we end up with negative 4.9 plus negative 4.9 t. That's the t squared. 4.9 t squared. Let's take out t common and we end up with negative 4.9 t plus 25. And this quantity is equal to zero. 
if this quantity is equal to zero, the product of these two is equal to zero, which implies, which implies that either t is equal to zero or this quantity, negative 4.9 t plus 25 has to equal to zero. Which makes perfect sense. When t is equal to zero, its, uh, it's, its height is zero because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's at the ground level. Then it's released. This quantity is equal to zero. Let's set, let's set this equal to zero, which means there's 4.9. Let's bring it to this side. So 4.9 t has to equal 25 if we bring it to the other side. That's it. We divide both sides by by 4.9, which is approximately the same as 25 divided by 5, and that's going to give us 5. In other words, in other words, such an object, such an object will hit the ground. Such an object will hit the ground in five seconds. At five seconds, it will hit the ground. That was number 25. Let's go to number 26. Let's see what we have in 26 here. 26. Ah, 26 is a is a. Well, actually, 26 is a very straightforward one. We need the room, obviously. I'm going to raise all of this thing. In 26, we are told that A is 20%. A is 20% more than B. We are told that A is equal to 144. The question simply is, how much is B? What must be B? What must be B in order for A to be 20% more than B and it in order for A to be equal to 144? Let's find out. If A is indeed 20% more than B, then A must equal 1.2 times B. That represents 20% more than B. 120% of B will equal A because A is 20% more than B. And we know what A is. It's 144. 144 must equal 1.2 B, which in turn implies that B must equal 144 over 1 1.2. 144 over 1.2. I don't know about you, but I, I'm not too keen on that 1.2 business. As I've told you many times, I detest, I hate, I loathe dealing with decimals. I get rid of the decimals as soon as I can, which is exactly what we're going to do here by multiplying top and bottom by 10. So we end up with 144 times 10 over 12. Now that makes our life easier. 144 is a perfect square. 144 is the square of 12. 12 square is 144. So if you divide top and bottom by 12, 144 disappears and becomes a 12. 12 times 10 is just 120, which must be the value of B. B must be 120, which of course makes sense because if you have 120, if you have 120, and if you add 10 more percent to it, you get you will have to add 12. If you add another 10 percent. In other words, if you take 120 and increase it by 20 percent, you'll end up with 144. That should be no surprise. Number 27. Number 27. In number 27, we are dealing with a plot of land, a plot of land which is a square field. A plot of land, a square field which happens to be 10 meter by 10 meter. In other words, a plot of, plot of land with, this, with the area of 100 square meter. It says that 10 randomly selected subplots of 1 meter by 1 meter. We're going to select 10, we're going to divide it into 100 equal parts, each being 1 meter by 1 meter, 1 meter squared. That small area of 1 meter by 1 meter, we're going to dig through it and we're going to find out how many worms there are. How many worms?
number of worms. The kids, the students, the kids, they're, they're outside, they're studying nature, and the teacher selected a plot of land, 10 meter by 10 meter, and she told 10 kids to uh, take ten, ten uh, to take 10 spots, make sure they are one meter by one meter, and just dig through it and see how many worms you find. That's all it is. And this is what we found. A, B, C, D, E, 107, 147, 146, 136 and 166 now the assumption being the assumption being that because these 10 subplots of one by one were chosen at random this is a this is a representative sample of the land and the question simply is how many total number of worms could I expect to find in this land which happens to be 10 meter by 10 meter based on these 10 observations that's all they're looking for they're looking for total number of worms approximately how many worms approximately How many worms in the hole 10 meter by 10 meter field? That's all it is. Now, before you, if you come across something like this, and before you turn this into a drama, into a saga, it's always a good idea to very quickly look at the answer choices, particularly, particularly when they tell you they're looking for approximate answer. That's their way of saying, whenever they use the word approximate, that's their way of saying, do not be a fool, do not be silly, do not put in a lot of time, do not invest a lot of time into it, we're not looking for it, we're just looking for a ballpark figure. At that point, it is important that you look at the answer choices to, see, to, to gauge, to see how much of an approximation can we get away with. There we go. So let's look at the answer choices. If you look at the answer choices, the answer choices are right here. The first answer choice is 150, the next one is 1500, the next one is 15,000, the next one is 150,000. As you can see, they're multiple of 10. They're nowhere close to each other. They're multiple of 10. In other words, we don't have to be very careful. We don't have to be very, very precise. As long as we can figure out the range for the average of these 10 subplots, one more time, as long as we can figure out the range for the average, the range of this, uh, range of uh, the average for the subplots, we don't have to figure out the actual average. One way is to figure out the actual average of these 10 sub subplots, and since that's the average of 10 of them, uh, and it's a representative sample, we multiply that average by 100 and get the answer. That's one way. But that's going to take a lot of time to figure out the average. We don't need to do that. We don't need such precision as long as we have a range which is fine. And how do you find the range for the average? Well, it's very simple. Let's pretend. Let's pretend that every single, every single subplot had 107 worms. Why 107? One? Why, why 107? Because that's the smallest number I see here. So, if you were to multiply that by 100, assuming that every single subplot of one by one has 107 worms in it, every single one of them, 100 of them. That will give us the lowest range for the total number of worms that we can expect, to, lowest value that is, for the total number of worms that we can expect to find in the whole 10 by 10 plot. Similarly, let's look for the, let's look for the biggest value. The biggest value is right here. There we go. That's it. We're done. That's all it is. We're done. Which means that the minimum, assuming that every single 1 by 1 plot has 100, 107 worms, which of course is not the case, but that's the lowest that is. It, it cannot be any lower than that, because everything is higher. So the lowest number of worms that we can expect to find is 107, 107 times 100, because there are 100 sub, because there are 100 such subplots of one by one, one meter by one meter. 107 times 100. Is simply going to be 10,700 
that's the lowest number of total number, that's the total lowest value of total number of worms that you can expect to find. It's not going to be actually that low because everything is in between here. And the highest number that it that can possibly be, assuming that this, this number of worm appears in every single plot, subplot that is, it's just going to be 176 times 100, which is 17,600. That's our range for the total number of worms that we can expect to find. Look how far apart the answer choices are. The answer is 15,000. Approximately, we can expect to find 15,000 worm in this part of land, which happens to be 10 meter by 10 meter. That's the end of that page. We're going to stop right here. Tomorrow we'll meet again and we'll pick up from where we left off. In the meantime, if you wish to get hold of me, in the meantime, if you wish to get hold of me, if you decide that you would like to work with me to help you get you ready for the exam, I can obviously help you with the math part. I can also help you with the grammar portion of the exam, which uh, rather the writing portion of the exam, which deals with grammar, uh, English grammar. I can help you with that part, and I can most certainly help you with the vocabulary part. If you wish to get hold of me, simply go to my website at kashwaniprep.com and send me an email. All right? We'll talk some more. Bye now.